So hopefully uh, you guys will excuse the quality of this video, or rather the lack thereof. Um, yeah, I don't have a fancy setup. It's my first YouTube video ever. So I thought I would do a review of the build quality of the Turbo Wheel Dart sold by eWheels, which is pretty much a rebranded version of the Zero Nine that's sold by uh, Falcon PEV, Personal Electric Vehicles. But I think generally speaking that eWheels' customer service um, is by far superior. And also they do have a slight modification, which is the battery to the, uh, that's inside the deck. It's just a better battery pack. It uses LG cells instead of cells that are made in Singapore. The difference being that you can tell um, there's a lot more data out there available on the reliability. Uh, the LG company is an ISO 9001 company, so there's certain quality control standards that they use when they make their battery packs, and you don't necessarily have that same guarantee with the Singapore cells that are used in the stock 09. So that's a nice little upgrade right there. Um, okay, so <clears throat> I wrote a review that I'm going to be posting online. So this is kind of a supplement to that because the build quality is something that you can go so in-depth into that it can become kind of ridiculous if you have to read all of that. I feel like a video is probably going to be a faster way, even though this is probably going to be a pretty long video. So uh, we'll start from the top down. Um, it's There's almost no plastic on the vehicle. It's uh, aluminum and steel construction. You have some rubber grips and handles here. You've got a little bit of plastic on the uh, housing for... The, uh, the brake lines, um, the brake mechanism, and a little bit on this little rinky-dink little bell here that is not the best thing ever. Um, it's just like a little little spring with a, uh, with a little hammer that you flick back. And, you know, if, unless you give it a really good whack like you saw before, just doing this doesn't do anything. So you really kind of got to pull it back all the way. Um, you'll notice here that the locking mechanism is actually a screw mechanism, which is really nice. Uh, it takes a little while to fully disengage it from the main piece, but once you do, it folds in nice and flat, comes up like this. And what's good about this is that unlike uh, other scooter models, where you'll just have a spring-loaded collar that'll come over this, um, this piece over here, over time, that's going to wiggle loose because there's a lot of force you're putting on this, right? I mean, you, you're some of your weight is being held by the handlebars. Sometimes when you're braking or whatever, your weight lurches forward. And when that happens, um, over time, the, the metal, if it isn't really, really strong and sturdy, can start to loosen. The tolerances get a little bit looser in this, and you get some wobble in play in here. But this works really well, and it's got a nice, good, um, knurled finish right along here. It makes it easy to grip and unscrew and screw. Now, <clears throat> as you're riding the scooter, uh, there can be a lot of vibration based upon your road conditions. So one of the things that can happen is that this can loosen a little bit, but when you stop at a light or something like that, you just give it like a little bit of a squeeze in one direction, cinch it up nice and tight, and then you're good to go again. Um, this is the dashboard here. We'll turn this guy on. There's actually some videos on the line of the Zero Nine. Uh, it's the same exact dash setup here. Um, it's nice. I like the brightness of this thing. It works really well. I mean, you're not really going to see it in the daytime, frankly, but there's really no good reason for you to be staring down at this thing unless you like clocking your own speed. Uh, especially, it's not a good idea, especially if you're in traffic, so I wouldn't recommend it. But there are other videos online that go into detail about the settings and stuff like that um, for like how to reach like secret settings, right? You can press the power and mode buttons at the same time, and then it opens up this kind of like settings menu where you've got... P1, P2, P3, all the way up through P20. And each one of those represents some function or some bit of data about the, the scooter system in general, things you can tweak. So uh, that, that's useful. Um, so you've got your front brake here. You've got rear brake on this side. And <clears throat> one of the things you'll notice here is... Uh, the cable management and this is kind of the other the other portion of the video so this scooter is not stock right there's been a few modifications made to it things that you're not going to find on the regular one and i mention this because while the zero nine or the turbo wheel dart are good standard scooters they're kind of made for 
easy riding. And what I mean by that is this. They're, they're marketed as daily commuters, but it kind of depends on the area in which you live, frankly. If you live in more of a West Coast area, like a lot of the ride videos that I've seen are for things like electric unicycles and scooters and you see them on these beautiful smooth stretches of road and they're nice and flat and they're paved really well and it's a bright sunny day and it's nice and dry outside yeah it's no problem but if you're using this thing to commute in all kinds of weather on the east coast and the crappy cities that we live in uh, you're dealing with salt buildup on the roads in the winter time which is terrible for all kinds of metal and electronic equipment and stuff like that. You're dealing with humidity, you're dealing with rain, you're dealing with snow, and you're dealing with really bad roads like potholes everywhere, cracks, bumps, train tracks, you name it, all kinds of stuff. So that really sucks. Um, so if you want to like ruggedize the scooter a little bit, weatherize it a bit so that it can withstand the elements, there are some modifications that I made that I'll go through and I'll show you what I did to kind of seal it up against the elements and make it wear a little bit better and last a little bit longer. So <clears throat> you'll see those as we start moving down the stem. So one of the things that I did, you'll notice here, the uh, extension tube going down here is smooth. It doesn't have any kind of features on it. It's, it's featureless. And the reason that matters is because it doesn't have any preset detents, no holes in it, no pin and, and no slots, anything like that. So this quick locking mechanism here basically lets you raise and lower it with infinite variability up and down from its full length. You're not stuck at like certain presets. You can customize it perfectly for your height. The downside is if for whatever reason you lose track of where you locked it, you kind of have to re-dial it in basically. So all I did was I painted a little white dot on the thing to let me know like exactly where I like to have it so that in future I don't have to think about it. Now, <clears throat> one of the nice things I like about this is that it has the infinite variability. It doesn't have a detent of any kind. And I also like this uh, cop, it's a brass piece right there, a little brass sandwich right in between the red lever and the black here. And that's important because all of these types of quick releases rely at some point on exerting pressure to compress metals together and compress materials together. And a lot of these quick releases you'll see on like bikes or other things oftentimes use these uh, plastic pieces. They don't use metal. Um, and from a wear perspective, that's nice. It's nice and soft on the metal, but from a longevity perspective, it's not that great because what happens invariably is the compression, every time you release it and then you compress it and you release it and compress it, and that, that fatigues the, the material and then it eventually cracks, especially if you use it in hot weather, cold weather, whatever, rain, sleet, snow, sun, it, all of that fatigues the material more, whereas brass is a much hardier metal it's soft by comparison to what it's being squeezed against, so it'll give a little bit, which is good, but it's gonna take a damn long time and a huge number of cycles of this lever before you have to worry about any kind of like cracking or breaking of that piece. And that piece is integral to making sure that you have good pressure and good tension and good clamping force right here where you need it to lock this bar in place. So that's a nice uh, thing that I like about this scooter. I thought it was well designed. Um, and then you're going to come down over to here and you're going to see there's this entry point right here that's, that I've taken the liberty of sealing. And this is actually originally where all the cables from up here kind of went down into the stem. And they went all the way down into the stem and they come out through here, which I've also sealed. You can see I've used like a silicone sealant to seal this up. Now... <clears throat> A lot of that I have removed. So the brake lines, you'll notice, do not go down that same hole anymore. And that's for a very important reason. And I bothered to seal this because originally all they have is a, is a gasket, like a red rubber gasket, or maybe it's black, I don't remember, that goes up here. And it doesn't really seal out moisture. It's good for shielding against like dust and debris. But if you're going to be using this thing in the rain or snow or whatever, right, you know, you do it at your own risk, of course, because it's obviously more dangerous than on a nice dry sunny day. But if you're going to do that, then the likelihood that water is going to find its way in here is very, very high. 
it's definitely going to get in there. It's going to go down into here. And while there aren't any exposed electronic wires inside of this, there is like a collar here that leads to the to the turning uh, joint for the front wheel. And there's all kinds of hardware in there. There's screws, there's springs, there's there's things that can rust and degrade over time. So it's just helpful to like squirt some silicone sealant inside here and really kind of seal that up really well. So that was one of the things that I did. And the other thing that I ended up doing was, like I mentioned, uh, I took the brake lines and I removed them from inside here for uh, two reasons. Um, there's well one reason, but there's two factors that 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 add up to this reason. Okay, so if you want your brake lines to be efficient, you want them to have very very smooth radiuses of curvature. So you don't want any sharp bends because you've got a little thin bit of metal wire in here. This steel um, wound cabling inside of this. And if you pinch this too hard and make it like too sharp of a, of a bend, right? Then there's gonna be a lot of friction at that bend and your brake lever isn't gonna work nearly as efficiently to squeeze the calipers to actually engage the brakes. So that's one thing. And the other is, there's even if you have very uh, smooth radiuses of curvature along your brake lines, right? The more brake line you have, the more friction there is in the system. The more friction there is in the system, the less efficient your brake lines are going to be. And since you're doing 22 miles an hour on this thing, at least for my weight you are, right? Like you want your brakes to work as well as they possibly can within reason. Hydraulic brakes would be a great upgrade for a system like this, I think. Um, but I don't know how feasible that is to convert. Well, I don't think you could convert the lines, but to replace the existing mechanical brake system with hydraulic brakes might be uh, a bit much because you'd have to figure out how to retrofit the calipers onto the existing mounts. So I don't know. I haven't really looked into that, but it's something I might be investigating in future. But these mechanical brakes work fine. I just wanted to optimize them. So I didn't want them to pinch. And... I also didn't need all of the extra brake cable that came with this. Because this stem extends higher than the length that it's currently set to, the manufacturer has to create enough brake cable length to account for that increase in length, right? So if you're gonna make the handlebars go as high as possible, you're gonna need all the brake cable line you can possibly get. But since I'm the only one that rides this scooter and I've dialed in my height and I'm never gonna go any higher than that, I don't need to, then there was some extra brake line that just was unnecessary, particularly in the front brake. Right here, you can see down here, this front brake line used to be quite a bit longer. You'll see some tape down here. This tape is actually purely cosmetic. There's no joint here that it's, that it's um, taping together. But down here, there's actually a joint. What I ended up doing was I ended up cutting off about eight inches of additional brake line using a, a Dremel uh, cutting tool and then I, I took the, um, the steel end cap that's used to properly terminate the end of the brake line and I put it back onto the, the fresh cut end over here so that it would have a um, unfrayed termination point, which is important for the use of the brake line. You want it to have nice, smooth interface between the inner, uh, the inner coiled wire and the outer sheath. You don't want like fraying on the outer sheath because you, you can cause rubbing and stuff like that that's unpleasant. So there was a lot of extra leftover brake line inside that I ended up cutting and I just used an epoxy putty to kind of uh, seal the, the strands so that they wouldn't be pokey and like, you know, uh, fray over time or anything like that. So it's one of the things that I ended up doing was, was shortening the front brake line uh, quite a bit and that helps to improve the efficiency. And you'll also notice that it's still a nice smooth transition. Same thing with the rear brake line, right? Nice and smooth. It's not, no sharp bends or curves, right? Now, originally what would have happened was the brakes would have come into here, right? So there would already be kind of like a tight fit in here because this is not exactly a, um, a very large hole. It would have gone down inside here and then it would have come out this this hole right here um, 
And that's almost a 90 degree bend, believe it or not. Like it's a very sharp bend for mechanical brake lines. For the electric wires that are coming out of here, it's not an issue. Like you don't care if it, if it bends like that, as long as it's not seeing repeated bending stress over and over again, and it's not. Um, it's not a big deal for electrical cables. But for mechanical cables where there's moving parts, you don't want that sharp of a bend. So that's why I ended up removing them from there. Uh, one of the other things I did along the stem as part of my sealing work, right, to seal it from the elements. Uh, I don't know if you can tell, but this is one of those, those like front LED strips that's on here. It turns blue when the thing is on. And it's pretty cool, actually. And it's great for visibility at night. Like not for you to see the road, but for like vehicles to see you. So you might notice there is some silicone sealant, clear silicone sealant all up along this channel. And then I ended up taping over the whole thing. Um, there's some tape all along here. This tape was primarily to bind the, uh, the, the brake lines. And there's a zip tie here for the brake lines. It wasn't meant for sealing this, um, this LED strip. And the reason that's important is because once again, right, the manufacturer never built this, intended it for like all weather use but water is a pain in the ass and it gets everywhere that there's any tiny crack or crevice or anything like that so you really want to bother to rainproof this thing if you want to use it in all weather so originally the led had a gap between this rail this black railing and then this led strip inside that water could have easily gotten into so i sealed the whole thing up using silicone sealant smoothed it out as best as i could with my thumb and then after it dried I taped over it very, very smoothly with this piece of uh, packing tape to make sure that it wouldn't get mucked up because the one thing with silicone sealant that can be problematic is that it's very, um, it attracts dust and debris because it's, it's fairly sticky even after it's dry. Like it won't get on your fingers, but like things stick to it easily. So dust and dirt and road grime over time would have like mucked this up and made the light a bit dimmer and not as bright or anything like that. With the tape over this, it keeps it nice and smooth and bright and shiny and I don't have to worry about that. Um, down here, there's another zip tie. Once again, that's just to hold the mechanical brake lines up against the stem, keep them in place, right? So they don't go shifting around all over the place. Um, and generally speaking, the uh, the quality of this collar is really, really good right here. This rotating collar, this is really, really uh, nice. It's solid. There is no play in here. When you feel motion, like if you're standing on the scooter and your hands are on the handlebars and you're resting some of your weight and you feel kind of like a rocking back and forth, what you're feeling is this joint here. This is the locking joint right here. You're not really feeling play in this mechanism, which is really good because a lot of these bearings can be loose or crappily made. And there tends to be like, there's like some shifting that occurs in this. And it gets worse over time because this thing is getting punished by all kinds of road conditions, right? I mean, you've got this front, this is just a gasket, but underneath it, there's this front spring and you've got this nice pneumatic tire. But as good as this stuff is, it can't prevent that shock from traveling up this whole thing. I mean, you feel it. It's not like your hands hurt, they don't vibrate or anything at your handlebars, but this mechanism is definitely feeling the forces of the road on it. So it's nice to know that it's built well enough that it's not gonna like rattle and come loose um, that quickly. Like it's gonna take a while for that to happen, which is good. It will happen eventually. I mean, all mechanisms break down over time, but it's gonna be a while. It's better than other ones that I've seen. Um, down here, you've got the front shock, you've got the front tire, and then this little modification here, which is like a little mud flap kind of, and I cinched it with uh, a nut and bolt on either side. There's one on the opposite side of the fender. And then also up along here, you might be able to see it. There's some uh, contact cement to help seal that up. And this is just like sheet rubber that you can find at like Lowe's or like in the plumbing section kind of a thing. They use it for gasketing material for toilets and stuff like that. Um, I actually put this on here not really to protect myself from whatever mud and dirt that might be flung up by the tire because all of that dirt and mud generally gets flung up into the folding mechanism so it protects me. But the problem is, what's protecting the folding mechanism, right? I mean, you've got this mechanism with moving parts in here 
that you want to remain gunk free and grime free and grit free because all that grit eventually acts as sandpaper and it just starts to abrade and corrode at this mechanism and it makes it looser. And a loose folding mechanism can be dangerous because if it gets too loose, like a bump could dislodge your locking pin. Um, it could make for just an uncomfortable, unpleasant ride. Your handling doesn't become as tight because now when you try to turn um, your, your wheels, you also have to deal with the additional play that's inside your locking mechanism. So it's always good to have a nice, tight mechanism. Everything should be like cinched down as much as possible. And so it just makes sense to have this little mud guard here to prevent grit and dirt and grime from getting in there more than is necessary. Like, obviously it's not perfect. It's not 100%, but it's a lot better than it would normally be if this wasn't in place. Like this would be all caked up with like road grime and crap and that wouldn't be good. Um, some of the other things that I did, some, some simple stuff, these set screws right here, there's one on each side. You can kind of see the other one over here. These set screws adjust this locking pin, which is this piece right here. Um, they adjust how much it goes in this way or comes out this way. And that's important because they essentially tighten the locking mechanism. Over time, your locking mechanism is just gonna loosen naturally with wear and you wanna be able to tighten that. So what I did was I replaced these. They used to be black oxide coated, which isn't bad for like weatherproofing, but I just got stainless steel ones from my local Ace Hardware store. Um, everything on here is metric, so these are metric sizes. Um, so yeah, just like as another weatherproofing kind of thing, right? Stainless steel is gonna last longer against the elements, against salt spray and stuff like that than black oxide coating will. Uh, and then to that end, same thing, go around to the other side and show you, the uh, front disc brakes is the same deal. So there are six screws. You can only see about three of them. Right here, these screws also, they, they affix this uh, disc brake to the wheel hub and they were also black oxide coated. And those do have a tendency to kind of rust over time, but these are stainless steel. I replaced these as well. Um, this nut and bolt right here, which is the locking nut for the axle, and this bolt is the axle itself, those are already uh, 304A2 stainless, so they're, they're actually pretty good. Um, another thing that I thought was pretty nice and that I appreciate is this uh, mechanical brake. It's single caliper drive only, so what's happening is, is that only one caliper is squeezing into the mechanism. It's not both calipers doing this, but it works very well despite how simple it is. I think it's pretty well built. Um, I haven't seen any signs that would suggest that it's going to be rusting or anything like that, so I'm, I'm pretty pleased with, with uh, the build quality on that. So now uh, we're going to kind of transition to two things here. So <clears throat> you're going to notice that in the original scooter, what happens is, is that after all the cables exit from here, right, they go into a hole that's inside this bar. This It's a steel, it's like a square tube that's curved, right? This is hollow in here. There's nothing in here. And there's a hole here. And you can kind of see it, the aluminum tape that I put over this does a good job of sealing out the elements, but you can still see the outline of this kind of oval hole here. And that's where all the wires, including the brake, uh, or no, 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 not the brake lines. The brake lines came out of here originally and just went onto the brakes. But all the electric wires came in through here. And I think they did that for like some kind of aesthetic reasons. Also, maybe a little bit because they wanted to do some like basic uh, weather, not weatherproofing, but it's, it's a little bit nicer when you have your your wires shielded from the elements, kind of. Um, but what, what, what happened originally was they went in here, there was a little gasket around here that didn't do much to prevent any kind of water from getting, into, getting inside of here, right? It shielded dust and road grime, but a little bit and not that well. And then underneath, there is a similar hole. I'm not going to try and get that angle because it's kind of wonky, but there's another exit hole, same shape as this one, right, that I taped over with aluminum tape. And what happened was the wires came out of that hole that was here, and they came down and they went into a hole that you can't see anymore because I plugged it up with, with uh, black silicone sealant into the top of this deck right over here 
right behind the trim of this plastic black cowling that you can see right in front. And this, I thought, was probably the biggest design flaw in the whole scooter. I mean, it works. It, it'll work with it like this. But to me, there were two issues with it. One, you have a hole right here that has like a dingy little gasket that does not do a job at all of sealing moisture out of here. And now, once again, the manufacturer never made it for that, right? Like it was meant to be driven on nice days and stuff and, you know, maybe like go through like a puddle every once in a while and that's it. It's not meant to handle rain and downpours and stuff, but there's no reason why it couldn't. But if you have rain and stuff like that, it's definitely going to go in here. And the reason that's a problem is because this whole front piece all along here, all the wires for the entire scooter, right? Like you would think that like there's a bunch of wiring inside here. There isn't. This whole deck is like pretty much the battery. That's it. The battery is huge, okay? There's some wires that run out here, like the brake line goes, and there's like a little channel inside along here and out through here. And this is the battery charging port. So there's some wires that come out from this plastic piece inside here that go to this charging port. But the center here is just the battery. And all of the spaghetti, as I like to call it, all the wiring is all jammed all up in here in this front piece right behind this plastic, okay? Um, so it was just inviting water into the most sensitive area of the entire scooter, right? Like the mechanical stuff that you see here in the front and on the back, right? Like you don't want water damage, but ultimately the motor is well sealed for the most part and the front doesn't have anything that's going to like be destroyed just because it got wet but you add the slightest bit of water to that spot like right in here forget about it you're going to fry your electronics in a heartbeat and then you're screwed because it's not a mechanical problem that's easy to diagnose or fix you're going to try and turn on your scooter it's either not going to turn on or if it turns on the throttle signal is not going to work or something like that and you're going to get really frustrated because it's like it's a non-obvious fix. There's nothing you can do unless you're really good at troubleshooting electronic problems. Admittedly, I'm not. But then you need to take out like a, a, an ohm meter or a voltmeter and like see whether or not you still have connectivity between the wires. It's, it's a pain in the ass to diagnose an electrical problem. All right? So that was one thing. And the other was this pinch point, as I mentioned before. So like this pinch point is really a problem because right down here, and it's hard to see, but this this piece, this um, bent piece, right, goes all the way down and almost comes flush with the deck when it's, when it's in this open configuration like this, when it's not folded, when it's unfolded. And it would, the wires would like hit up against that piece every single time you would fold the scooter forward or fold it back, right? The wires would rub against that and pinch and bend really sharply right there. And that's just a recipe for early like breakage of these lines, right? Electrical lines should be left alone. They should not be re experiencing repeated mechanical stress. When you have an electrical line, the only thing that it should ever have to deal with is like hot and cold and that's it. It shouldn't be dealing with, with constant bending back and forth. I mean, there's a certain amount that's kind of unavoidable with a folding scooter like this. You're gonna have bending stresses, but you certainly don't wanna have anything as sharp as a pinch point that causes almost a 90 degree bend in the cabling right there. And that's what was happening. So this is what led to probably the scariest mod that I did on this whole scooter. I'm gonna try and move the scooter around for a second. Bear with me. Okay. So what I ended up doing was rerouting all the electrical lines. You saw that I sealed this up over here, and I sealed up the hole down there, and I sealed up the hole inside this plastic here. So what this line represents, this sheathed cable, represents all of the electrical wiring that is now going into here. And clearly this was not the original entry point because I've done my damnedest to like seal it up using contact cement and silicone sealant, but that's another story. So I ended up having to desolder some connections inside this. So first things first, right? I had to remove these screws, two on each side, and then one on the bottom on each side, all right? To kind of like pop this cowling off. And then I had to like very carefully trace the lines and figure out where they all went and desolder them. And admittedly, it was 
It was a little freaky, um, kind of a pain. Not impossible or too difficult. This video is meant as information. For those people who are comfortable doing this kind of stuff, it's a play-by-play. -play. You guys can figure it out. You can figure out which lines you need to desolder and which ones you don't, and it'll work out for you. For others, you know, skip this portion of the video, move on to a different section, and that might be more, more useful to you. I don't, I don't expect everyone to be like, oh yeah, I'm totally comfortable doing stuff that's probably gonna avoid my warranty and destroy my scooter. You know, you gotta have some sense in what you're doing and a little bit of mechanical acumen and electrical acumen for that matter. So I was willing to take the risk. So anyway, um, yeah, I pulled the lines out from here and there was a hole here, but the hole originally was only for this rear brake line to go back in through here all the way back and out to the to the rear brake over there, which I'm gonna to get to eventually. What I ended up doing was I ended up widening this hole. Like I took a knife and a little saw blade and file and sandpaper and all that good stuff and like widened it up so I could put all these, uh, run all these cables through here instead, right? And then I had to mash all that spaghetti very gently back inside here, re-solder the lines, close this back up. And then there were two important things I did here because obviously this was never intended to, to have this be here. So one was I took a giant gob of silicone sealant in here as much as I possibly could, like tried to shoot it inside because silicone sealant, nice thing about it is it's electrical insulator. So you don't have to worry about it like shorting out or corroding your wires or anything like that. This whole interior, if I wanted to, I could have just, just gooed up with silicone all over it and it would have been kind of gross and, and a bit of a mess, but it would have been that like extra, extra mile to preventing any water damage from getting in there. But I basically sealed up as much as I could inside here, in past the plastic, right? Then I sealed the wires themselves. So that's something that you, you won't notice here. I'm not gonna undo this zip tie to kind of show you and undo the sheath, but there's actually a plug of silicone up 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 to this point right here along the wiring. And the idea is this, this sheathing is good for dirt and debris, but it's essentially like a plastic fabric weave. So what happens is as rain gets into this, right, it, it soaks in and then the wires are loose wires inside here. They're protected, they're individually sheathed with rubber. It's not like it's just exposed copper that's inside here. But what's gonna happen is, is the water's gonna wick down through those wires inside, and then inside through those wires, it's gonna wick into this chamber. And if you don't think that's gonna happen, then you don't know all that much about water and how it loves to seek out through capillary action, every little nook and cranny that it possibly can. Believe me, it would do that if you're gonna use it in rain over time. This inside would get humid, then it would get wet, then it would fry, and then you'd be screwed. So I created essentially a plug what I did was I, 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 I gooed up silicone all up into this whole area here to prevent like any kind of water from wicking in through the lines. And then I gooed up even more silicone around here, but eventually that silicone peeled off because this plastic is not the best stuff for adhering silicone to. It's kind of a smooth plastic. And while I did my best to prepare the surface, you know, I used uh, acetone and um, uh, denatured alcohol to clean and dry it of any type of grease or oil or whatever. Ultimately, uh, contact cement worked better because the silicone delaminated. But even then, you can see that the silicone, the, the contact cement is starting to delaminate as well. And the reason is, is because this joint does see quite a bit of force. Like, I store this scooter in the locked position, so in the folded position, sorry. So I fold it up. And while the, the curve that's created by this cable, you know, comes kind of like this, it's, it's a smooth curve, it's still kind of putting some stress on this joint. And this joint is meant to flex, but you want it to be sealed around the edges. And that's something that just takes repeated um, coats of contact cement over and over again with time. Eventually you'll build up a plug big enough and if somebody has a better idea for how to do this, I'm seriously all ears. That is that is not meant uh, as an arrogant aside. Like, I'm genuinely interested in figuring out a better way to seal this, a guaranteed way where it can handle the mechanical stresses of repeated, you know, folding and unfolding of this mechanism without coming loose. I, I have yet to find a really good one. I think 
the next thing I'm going to try might be like some some epoxy the some epoxy resin that I that I put along the edges of this so that while the center is still flexible the edges of this stay well sealed so we'll see how that works out but that was by far the scariest thing I did uh, to the scooter that and the the brake lines because the brake lines were a little tough to kind of pull through the stem here and I pulled them out through the top uh, at least the front brake line I did that with so yeah that kind of freaked me out all right moving along so <clears throat> we get to this cowling right I also did you can see this this little bit of like black discoloration along here that's silicone sealant along this plastic cowling so after I did all this mishmash and secured it back up with screws I ended up sealing these gaps along here and the reason that's important you'd be like yeah but there's screws over here like why do you need to seal this as well okay this plastic right here is very thin all right and you have these flathead screws which means that the holes here are countersunk all right they're sitting flush with the surface so what's happening is is that the thin plastic is even thinner it's made even thinner by the fact that there is less material here so that the screw heads are flush with the top right so and they're very they're very small screws they're still like really really short so they don't really get very much engagement into the metal that they're being screwed into and because of that and they also have very fine threads so they're not really meant for exerting a lot of pressure on this so the screws themselves cannot cannot cause the plastic to squeeze hard against this part of the um, of the deck particularly since there's grip tape here but that's that's another story so the screws alone couldn't do the job and once again we're not talking about shielding it from dust and debris we're talking about sealing it from water it's a very big difference so one of the things I did was I replaced these screws with stainless steel versions. They were also black oxide, so I replaced them. And you can see on the other side, same thing, as well as the ones underneath, which I'm not going to show you just yet, but trust me, they're there. Uh, and then I used the black DAP silicone sealant along here as well. And along this gap too, and other gaps like it, I used that as well. All right, and you'll see that throughout the build. Uh, that little red chalk line is not actually a chalk line. That's actually the paint or yeah I guess it's paint coming off of the edge of this thing um, because this is not super smartly designed I mean it's, it's pretty good it works well it's pretty robust but um, when you unlock it right it kind of scrapes against the grip tape a little bit and it leaves behind a little bit of a marking so just FYI um, <clears throat> so another thing that I ended up doing this scooter uh, might be a little hard to see but this is the battery's uh, charging port, okay? Now, originally, and you might notice this white stuff, that's Teflon tape. Originally, there was a black rubber gasket around here that had a little piece stick out over here with um, a, a cover, a, a black rubberized cover, plastic cover, that would just push over this and just cover over it. It wasn't a screw cover or anything like that. It was just a press fit. And the problem was is that it's not the best mold that they used to make this rubber piece. So there was some flashing on the X on the outside of the mold. Even after removing all that flashing, it just didn't seat well. And over time with the vibration of it on the road, it would come loose. Now, 99% of the time, it's not gonna be a problem. But once again, if you're dealing with rain, you're trying to weatherize it, right? You don't want that little rubber gasket to come off ever while you're riding this thing. So I ended up creating my own little cap there was another scooter that I had. This was the ring from the charging cable that was attached to it. And I figured because there aren't too many manufacturers of all these parts, I took a gamble and figured that the ring that, that was used to um, affix the charging cable to the other scooter's port was probably the same threads as on this one. And wouldn't you know it, I was right. They were the same threads. So I used some epoxy putty to create an actual cap out of it. And then I just kind of filed in, once the epoxy dried, I filed in these grooves to make it easier to like get a grip on this piece and, you know, screw it and unscrew it. And I just used a black marker to, to color it black. And uh, so like it just kind of matches the body of the, um, of the scooter. So yeah, that was a little thing I did. Also, originally, the, um, the actual port itself 
would rotate freely against the, the body of the deck because it wasn't really well affixed, right? It's dissimilar metals. It wasn't glued or soldered or anything like that. And they didn't bother to create like a locking nut or something to put around this to kind of lock it in place and affix it in place. So I ended up doing just a little bit of just, I don't even know if I used super glue or not. I might have used like E6000 or some other glue like that. And I just kind of glued it in place. Um, it works for the most part. There's a little bit of movement because I I should have used like um, like a, either a super glue or a five minute epoxy and been more careful, but it doesn't really see that much stress. So it doesn't rotate that much. As long as I don't over torque this cap in place, it really doesn't shift all that much. And it's, it's sealed well enough against the elements here. Um, underneath here, you're also going to see more of those LED lights. Yeah, good luck. Okay, hang on. <clears throat> Give me a sec. So yeah, more LED lights. Uh, did the same thing as I did with the front one, all right? There's a silicone sealant all along there. You can't see it because it's nice and clear, and I did a much better job with these ones than I did the front. And then once again, there's uh, tape all along here uh, after it dried out. Um, over in here, more contact cement. There's contact cement in there inside this gap here between the cowling, the plastic cowling, and the, and the chassis, the deck body. So all this in an attempt to seal out as much as possible all of the moisture and things like that. Then you notice there's these four little um, screws. These four screws hold in place the electronic speed controller for this scooter. And you can see that they're socket cap screws. They kind of stick out pretty far. What I did was I put these black furniture caps over them and I glued them in place because when you fold the scooter, right, the rear wheel comes up. So the first thing that touches the ground on the front are these two screws. So not that there's any good reason to be messing with those screws on the regular, but you also don't want them to grind against the ground and get scuffed up and crapped up over time. And just in case, for whatever reason, you have to do any maintenance to them, you want them to be easy to remove and you want the, the head of the screw to be intact so that the driver can fit into it without any problems. So I put these over them to kind of protect the heads of the screws and prevent, uh, you know, the grinding of them over time if I like rest it on pavement or whatever for like half a second. So there's that. Uh, another thing that I ended up doing, um, this is a piece of silicone tubing. This has nothing to do with any kind of weatherproofing, but the kickstand, which is a good kickstand, um, inside there it's, it's metal and it's a metal shoe. So on like pavement, that's great. But as you can see, I have hardwood floors. So if you have hardwood or tile or linoleum floors and you don't want them to get all crapped up, um, I just put this piece of silicone tubing over this so that it's much softer and it doesn't uh, you know, scratch the floor or anything like that. Uh, another thing that I ended up having to do, the screws that they used to affix the, um, the, the kickstand to the scooter body had like much thinner threads and they were kind of smaller diameter. And the problem is, is that they're steel screws going into an aluminum body and it's a thin wall. So when you have thin wall aluminum and you have a steel screw and you have some forces, right, going on here, because it's non-trivial the amount of weight that this thing has to, has to hold up, right? Over time, you're going to make, you're going to widen those aluminum holes because the screw, the screws are steel. They're not going to bend. What's going to give is, is going to be the aluminum body. And that's what this is. This is aluminum, this, uh, this surface right here. So what ended up happening was this whole assembly ended up kind of like getting looser and rattling, you know, like right at this joint. Like this was not flush against this piece anymore. So I just took one size larger steel screws, still steel granted, but um, I think they're galvanized, and I just sort of manhandled them in there. I just used my, my, my power driver to just kind of jam them in as tight as I could, kind of used them to tap new holes, you know, larger holes into the body. And now there's, there's, no, there's no play. If there's any play, it's only here at, at these two riveted joints, but not, not at the screws. So this is a much sturdier um, kickstand now than it used to be, which is good. Uh, more of the ceiling that you can see on the back here, contact cement, same thing. Um, 
these screws are okay these four screws are holding these pneumatic uh, red pneumatic shocks in place which are very nice they make for a super comfortable ride um, then you have this is the power cable that leads into the motor the rear wheel is the motor and you can see that once again I took a lot of trouble to seal this as best as I could because in order for this rear wheel to receive power, you need to have electronic wiring going into this and it's doing so through the axle. So this axle here that you can't see is hollow. It has to be to allow the wires to go into the motor itself. So what they did was they routed the wires through there. You have this piece of shrink tubing here it comes over a spring. There's a steel spring right here and this spring is to ensure that there isn't a tight bend, like it doesn't cause the cables to kink, right? They knew enough to not want these cables to kink. The problem is, is that the spring was gonna rust. And also the spring has a whole bunch of little grooves in it all over the place. Unsealed, water was gonna hit this and wick its way inside the shaft, inside the axle, and then into the motor, and then you are proper fucked because there is not a damn thing you can do short of disassembling this motor and praying that you can de-rust this thing without destroying the motor entirely and putting it back together again. So once water gets in here, that's it. Replace the rear wheel. You need a new motor. So to avoid that, I ended up taking silicone sealant and I sealed all of that. And I even sealed up the, uh, the hex nut that holds the axle in place because that hex nut is not a uh, rust proof hex nut. So I said, you know what? Let's just put a giant gob of it all the way around, seal up all these surfaces, make sure no water or rust is gonna get onto that uh, piece. Um, some of the other screws that I ended up replacing, more uh, these ones right here, which connect the rear fork to the, uh, the the hinge point right here where the pneumatic shocks work. Um, these were originally black oxide. I changed them to stainless as well. There's four of them. Um, so that was another little weatherproofing thing. And then over here as well, um, the power cord coming out of this channel. Over here you might see some silicone sealant as well all along the back here. Uh, these rear lights which are the brake lights, and they're, they're really bright, they're really good. Um, they were glued in place using hot glue uh, by the manufacturer, which is good. It's a perfectly reasonable method to do that, but they only did like a couple of spots, like they spot glued it. Like if you, if you open up this cowling and you go like behind, you look behind this thing, right? Like you'll see that they only did it in like one or two spots and water could get in through the, the crack between the light and this like little port right over here, this plastic port. So I just went on the inside after undoing this plastic cowling, right? I undid the screws all along here and I popped it off and I hot glued all around that light instead and I did it on the other one as well, just to seal that up uh, nice and tight and prevent any water from getting in there. Uh, and we're getting kind of to the end of this whole thing. Um, just putting the kickstand back up. Bear with me. Okay, there we go. Kickstand is up. And then over here, we've got pretty much the same thing on the other side of the rear wheel. Now, this wasn't as crucial because this side of the axle is not hollow, but you still have an axle uh, with open threads here. You've got more hardware that is not really rust proof so I just kind of weatherized it with this stuff now does it mean that it makes it more cumbersome to disassemble this should I ever have to do that yeah I'm gonna have to take a knife and kind of just like peel this off but this is soft material that a knife is gonna go right through remember this is not glue right this is not an adhesive this is a sealant so while it's gonna make it a little bit messier and it's gonna take a little bit longer to undo it's not gonna mean that I have to use crazy force or anything like that and I've glued it and it's permanently in place now and there's no way for me to easily unscrew any of that stuff. I can still do that pretty easily. Um, one of the things that I wanted to make mention of was this rear uh, brake lever here. 
I actually really like the way they did this. And what I like about it is that it's adjustable. And you might be like, well, yeah, no doubt it's adjustable. Aren't they all? <laughs> no. No, they are not. I wish they were all adjustable, but some designers, Ecorico being the main one, makes a rear brake lever that you cannot adjust the rear cable's tension on from here. The connection point between the brake line itself and this lever arm is a, it, it's not solid, you can remove it, but it's not adjustable. You can't pull more line out this way and then cinch it down with the screw and get a tighter uh, brake action doing that. They didn't design it that way. They designed it to just be a T-stop. So essentially, this piece is beefier on theirs. It's got like a, a aluminum or steel grommet on here that sits in a recess inside the lever arm and then that's it. If you want to do any adjustments, you got to do them up at the handlebars. You can't do them down over here. And nine times out of ten, you really shouldn't be adjusting your uh, brake tension at your handlebars. You should be doing it here. Only minor, minor adjustments should be being made at your handlebars. Eventually, over time, your cable is going to stretch so much that even with the maximum amount of, of unscrewing that you've given to the system, right? You're still going to need to uh, to shorten the brake line by having something like this. So I'm just very appreciative that they used some common sense in this design and came up with a very simple way to just kind of clamp, right? You can see it right here. Just clamp that in place there. Now, this is not using a hex head, which would have been nice. It's using uh, Phillips. Uh, and a bigger Phillips, uh, a bigger Phillips than just the, um, like the regular number two. I don't know if it's like a three or a four or something like that. But um, yeah, so it's it's a bit more prone to stripping. I might eventually at some point in time replace it with a, with a, a hex head or a, a, a socket uh, cap head. But in the meantime, it's perfectly fine. It works perfectly well. So overall... The build quality of this scooter is really, really great. Um, oh, another thing, just a rear mud flap. And you're saying, yeah, but don't you see the rear fender here? Yeah, I see the rear fender, but it's not long enough to prevent rooster tailing. Like, the wheel still comes out a little bit past the actual fender. And I've ridden this when it was wet, and I got a rooster tail going down my back. So I put this mud flap on here, which is a more of that um, rubber gasketing material like you saw on the front. Same thing, just two uh, nut and bolts on the inside and outside of this thing, and a little bit of uh, contact cement um, along here to just help further seal it in place. And it's nice and loose and soft, so it doesn't, it doesn't get in the way or get damaged if it hits the ground or anything like that. Like, I don't care if it hits anything, it just flaps back in place and it, it works really, really well. And it doesn't really add that much weight. So I did end up opening this thing up completely and looking inside the battery compartment. And I will say that there is a very nice rubber gasket that seals the battery compartment in place underneath the deck plate. In order to access the deck plate, though, it's kind of a pain in the butt. You have to remove these cowlings first. Then you actually have to remove the grip tape itself because the grip tape is placed directly over the screw holes that allow you to unscrew the deck from the chassis of the uh, the deck plate from the chassis of the scooter. So it's a bit of a process to get into the, the deck here. Granted, there really isn't much reason for you to do that. The only time you should ever have to go into the deck of this thing is if you're replacing the battery and that should happen like once every year and a half to two years if you're using it reasonably. Um, so yeah, so overall, I think that the build quality on this scooter is really good. Uh, none of the essential components are plastic or like, you know, hard ABS. Pla like, it, I don't care what quality plastic you're, you were talking about here. Like, I know there's some better plastics than others. But with something like this, you want as much metal as you can possibly get. Metal is better for rugged applications. It's heavier, granted, but... Ultimately, it's going to last you a lot longer. The fenders are, of course, plastic, and that's not a problem. They don't need to be anything other because they're not handling any load. But, um, yeah, I thought that the build quality overall was really good. 
There are, of course, a couple of design issues that I mentioned before that I think were kind of like not super well thought out on their part, not the best decisions they could have made for longevity and stuff like that. I think they were made more for aesthetics because admittedly it does look nicer, right? It'd be a lot sleeker if all the wires just came in through the stem and then came out and down and were all hidden. Like it looks a lot cooler and everything, but ultimately it, the scooter's not going to last as long. Not in the types of conditions that I ride in anyway. So, yeah, um, this is it. This is my review and the modifications that I made to it. I'm really pleased overall with the scooter. And if you have any questions, feel free to lay them out in the comments. I'll be happy to answer them. Um, thank you very much. Bye.